Thank you, Dick, for agreeing to do this video with me. This is our third in this HBT video series. The first of ours was uh, back in April 2012 at the 50th anniversary uh, conference for ISPI. And thank you for doing that one with me way back then. The second one was uh, just in January of 2019. But, but here we are at the midpoint of 2020 with a global pandemic disrupting just about everything including how organizations are approaching instruction, training, learning, et cetera. Let me start off with my first question. What do you see as the eventual outcomes for L&D from all of this disruption? Well, uh, this, we're still early in this whole process, I think. Um, you know, people at the medical school at USC tell me they think that this is going to be another two to three, maybe even four year process. So what we've experienced so far, we're what, in July of 2020. My take is that we're gonna be talking about this for the next two or three years. But here's what I think is gonna be the more positive side of what's a really terrible situation. I think we're gonna learn a great deal more about learning and online. Um, I, I think that we're gonna advance it hugely if we're smart about this. And a lot of people I think are getting very smart, particularly these people that we call big data people, learning analytics people that analyze keystrokes and try to figure out what works and what doesn't. And uh, so I think that's the benefit. The downside, uh, particularly uh, maybe long distance, is that I think people are gonna get a very bad impression of online learning. Uh, I, I, I think that's already happening. I hear so many people with children in schools, my own kids, others, saying this is terrible stuff and you know we all forgive it because everybody was struck with this at the last minute there weren't a lot of plans to to accommodate this and everybody's making do they're doing the best they can but i think there's a natural human phenomenon that if you experience something new and for the first time it's terrible and it's consistently terrible over weeks or months you go away with a very bad impression of it. And I worry that that's going to be some, a, a, a very fast moving stream. We're going to have a swim upstream again as we try to improve what we're doing. But do you see hope for people in the business L&D improving this, whether it's in you know, corporate America, excuse me, the enterprise learning across the globe and in the educational system? I mean, it is something that they can address and improve. You think? I hope I hope eventually that happens, because I think first of all it's going to be a very steep learning curve for a lot of people in L and D who've been focused more on training design or uh, in person training. Uh, I, I think everybody's turning to ask questions about well how do you do this, and frankly there's a lot of conventions about how you do it that are irrelevant. They don't make any difference whatsoever. Chat room stuff and so on. Um, and there are some things that make a huge difference that people are not paying any attention to whatsoever. Um, we could talk about some of those things. We actually did uh, a, uh, an analysis of how the top experts at online education, these instructors who were designing and presenting online courses, how they, why they were so successful. And I'd like to see a lot more of that kind of research because no way did we capture it in a couple of studies. But I think there's some indicators there that would surprise a lot of people, actually. So I'm hopeful that out of a bad thing might come a lot more knowledge about how to do online training and development. Excellent, thank you. Well, let me shift gears here a little bit to a topic that I think is near and dear to both of us. I'm uh, very interested in people doing design after they've done analysis. And it seems to be a huge shortcoming here. I think it's the, uh, the result of analysis paralysis of uh, uh, processes and approaches that just took forever and didn't seem to add much value to a lot of the clients and they've almost forbid it and uh, learning executives and managers no longer <laughs> insist that people conduct analysis but i'd like to talk to you uh, in particular about cognitive task analysis and i know that you've been promoting this and doing this for a, a long time but can you can we start off with you telling our audience here exactly what is cognitive task analysis? Well, it's an attempt at the front end of this discussion to improve 
front end analysis in training and development. I mean, I, I don't know whether colleagues that are listening to this video would agree or not, but if you look at current models of instructional design and training design, I think that front end analysis is the weakest part of all those models including many of them that attempt to be evidence-based. So cognitive task analysis is an attempt to, how would you put it, fill in the blanks to try to improve the areas of front end or what people often call task analysis to, uh, to make it better. And what we're making better is the fact that in the last 15 years, we, and I say we, I mean many people in research in psycho the psychologists that approach training and development have found that experts who are the, the, the primary source of most of the information we get for training are unaware of very key things that they do to be successful at their area of expertise. We think about 70% of the decisions and the analysis that experts make, which is so critical to their success rate, they're not aware of it. They, they, they can do it, they can be very successful at it, but when you ask them how, they're, they're not even aware that they do it. I mean, everybody has this automated knowledge. Just think of driving a car. I mean, when you're in a car and driving, after you're skilled at driving a car, you can be in terrible traffic. I lived in Los Angeles for 30 years, and believe me, that was terrible. And you don't think about the traffic. You're listening to music. You're listening to the news. You're, some people are learning a, a second language as they drive, whatever it is. You're driving. Who's driving the car? while you're doing that? Well, you are, but with this automated knowledge. So it's a plus in the sense that it helps everybody compensate for the fact that our conscious awareness is extremely limited. We used to say it was seven plus or minus two things we could think of. Well, it's not, it's been revised and it's now three plus or minus two. And when you try to think of more than two or three things at once, your brain has a fuse in it, so to speak. It, it actually literally shuts down, puts you in kind of a dreamy state. I, as a matter of fact, that's what it's called often. You're dreaming, you're daydreaming, whatever it is. And it prevents you from taking in more information. So this is an attempt to capture from experts that 70% that they themselves are not aware of. Can you overview the steps in a CTA process? Yeah, a lot of the steps I think would be familiar to people that do task analysis. First few anyway, we sure start out. Well, let's wait, let's, let me talk about first the selection of experts, which turns out to be critical. Okay. I mean, everybody that does a job is not an expert. Everybody calls themselves an expert is not an expert. An expert is a person who's done something long enough and consistently successful enough to be a person who we have objective evidence is actually succeeding at what they're doing. Um, and they have to be willing actually to go through this process because it upsets some experts to be asked over and over again, how do you do that? So first of all, it's a selection of experts. They have to have, um, they have, to have done the job recently, but we also find that we can't select experts who only train in their area of expertise. They've got to balance training with doing or it turns out that they invent all kinds of descriptions of how to do something that they themselves don't actually do. So once we've selected an expert, we have a six part program that, that we use to implement this. We're interviewing experts, trained cognitive task analysts, interview an expert, to start out as usual, focusing on tasks now, not on jobs, but the question is, what sequence of tasks do you perform in order to do this job? And if there's no necessary sequence, then we wanna go from easy to difficult because that's the way we wanna train. We would train things in the sequence of which they're performed, or we try to train people with things that are easier to do before the more difficult things. So secondly, we then go into the biggest part of cognitive task analysis in my view, which is capturing the when and how they perform each task that we're analyzing. And the how part turns out to be extremely difficult. That is, we're looking for what we call action and decision steps. Uh, actions are something you do actively. Decisions are something you do in your mind, let's say. And it's the decision steps that are so hard to capture. That's step two. 
once we've gone, we, we record the interviews, we make notes, try to get a pacing of what's going on and so on. So step three then is that we actually do, um, we, we, we have all of the, uh, uh, the tapes that we make uh, typed up. So we have a transcript of the interviews and then we start editing the transcripts that, uh, for the information that we captured so that the language and the flow is going to be meaningful to trainees who are going to be trained to do what this expert does. So we might modify some of the things that the expert tell us, not to make them inaccurate, but to make them maybe easier to understand. Then that's step three, and that's only for the analyst. Now the expert is not involved in step three. Step four, however, once we have a complete description of the interviews that we've given, we go back to each expert. By the way, we only interview experts in sequence, never together. We never even have them in the same room together because they start arguing with each other and that the whole thing falls apart with us at that point. So we ask them in sequence again, we, we take this printed thing back to them, the printed description of the task and we say, edit it. Tell us what's wrong. Tell us, tell us what we missed, what we didn't hear, what you forgot. In other words, let's edit this document so that it's accurate. After we do that with one expert, we go to the second expert, interview them, and then take their interview back to them. We go to the third expert, interview them, take their interview back to them. We find that we don't have to interview more than three to four experts to get the most that we're going to get out of this process. And then once we have all three experts reviewing, now we go to expert one again and say, here's what expert two and three said. They have things, steps that are a few different, a bit different than yours. What's your reaction to that? Do you think they're accurate? Would you change what you think? So now we get them all to try to agree to one version of this task. We call that a gold standard. And that's step five, where we're trying to collapse all the separate versions into one simple, parsimonious, extremely clear way to describe how to do something step by step. Um, we occasionally, in some fields like medicine, have to take that gold standard to a group of physicians who are in charge of deciding how a surgery gets done or how some treatment has to perform. There's legal issues, sometimes in engineering we have to deal with, but generally we want a final gold standard. Um, that gold standard is going to be pulled into training design, obviously. And the sixth and final step is that we collect a lot of information that task analysts always have to collect. What equipment do you use to do this? Uh, what standards are there that we that have to be met by this task? Are there any engineering standards, any medical standards, any scientific standards, and so on? Um, all that sort of information. Oh, we also collect examples from experts. What's a good example of this? Uh, so that we can use those examples in training. And finally, uh, what we found to be extremely important, and we didn't do this at first and to our peril, we ask, experts usually know what difficulties trainees have when they first start learning something. They've been involved with people who've learned to do what they do. So asking them, where do trainees get stuck? What problems do they have when they're learning to do this? At what point does it seem extremely difficult for them? By the way, that led us to go back and we found a number of decisions that we were never informed about that were causing trainees trouble. I could give you know, examples of this for the next day and a half. It, there were some extremely important things that that turned up for us. So then after we have all this information, we then go to the next stage, which is design. The usual training design uh, which is laying out the steps and beginning to create a document that's a training design. Thank you. Can you, can you give us a clue? I know it depends on the scope of the assignment, what you're looking at, but, but how long, what kind of a range in days or weeks might this process take? Well, we've kept, you know, we always are asked by clients that we're doing this for what how long it's going to take and our answer has to be well it depends on how complex the task is or or the set of tasks you want us to to accomplish we keep very close records um, so here's some examples i think one of the most complex cognitive task analysis i ever performed was with patent examiners 
Uh, we re-examined re the uh, patent examination process for the European Patent Office, actually in Munich. 134 hours for subject matter experts with all this. From start to finish, we used that much time from subject matter experts. But the analyst, the CTA analyst, is about double the amount of time for the, uh, for the experts. So it was uh, 280 hours for cognitive task analysts. Um, when I mentioned that we did a study of online faculty. Uh, there was three people we interviewed and 24 hours for the SMEs and 65 hours for the analyst. Uh, we did paralegals, study of all paralegals in the United States. We had some of the top paralegals, 88 hours for paralegal SMEs and 65 hours for the analyst. I think the shortest I can ever remember was 17 hours for uh, army recruiters. We actually did a study of the best army recruiters, 42 hours for the CTA analyst, quite a bit more than double, but not much more actually. So that's the best I can do. I, so that varies from what, 130 hours for SMEs to 17 hours for SMEs. No, oh, excellent. Thank you for that. I, I think people always want to know, you know. Sure. A well, it's a, it's a huge cost issue. Here's, yes. here's a better question and answer. What does it cost? What's the cost benefit? Mm -hmm. And what we found is that it added about 80% of time to front end analysis. I mean, 80% over the traditional kind of slapdash uh, task analysis. But the benefits on the other side hugely outweighed the cost, the initial in increase in cost. We've talked about this before. So, how close to near perfect does this process get one? Well, if you start out with the notion that we have a 70% deficit in the knowledge that we need to give to novices so that they can successfully perform, um, we get about 80% to there to the ideal situation. We can't easily get beyond 80%. I mean, there are some things that are so deep and so unconscious that even with multiple experts, we can't get them. Where we have to get them is analyzing the performance of novices who are now trained and outperforming, where do they make mistakes? And that tells us where the extra 20% is. So we try to keep in mind that we have to revise the training after the first cohort goes through the training and we assess what they do. So it's, a, it's an approach that's uh, similar to continuous improvement. You're gonna yeah, have to continue to look at. Yeah. Yep. And you're going to, okay. Not only that, the job changes. So we have to also keep monitoring those changes and modify the training based on that. That's all part of the continual improvement. Mm -hmm. Well, where can one learn more about CTA? Uh, and uh, who, well, let's stick with that question to start with. Well, you know, the, I don't think I can give an answer to that right now. I think they're uh, we train people to do CTA, but we generally do it from an organizational perspective. We're usually hired by organizations to come in and train some of their people to do CTA. They then provide for us experts. So the training actually accomplishes work for, the, for, for a client. So you, your output is not only trained people, your output is CTAs that you can use. So that, that seems to be the most cost effective way to do this. I don't, there, there only been a couple of times when we've offered public CTA workshops. Uh, the one that we do is a four day intensive workshop and then two to three months afterwards of submitting work and getting feedback on how it's going. And then we certify people in CTA. The reason why more people are not doing this, in my view, is that it's a proprietary strategy for a lot of businesses that do CTA. They offer to do it, but they're not inclined to train people to do it because that would be a, probably a challenge to their bottom line. Yes. And by the way, there are more than a hundred versions of this thing out there. And only six of those versions do we have any evidence whether they work or not. And out of the six, only three actually are real contenders. Yeah, I think that's really important. We talked about that back in 2012, where you said that you guys had done studies at uh, USC and come up with uh, over a hundred variations on CTA. So I just want to make sure that people are forewarned that there's a lot of uh, claims perhaps of, uh, of a methodology, but uh, as you say, um, it's slim pickings when it comes to uh, which ones are valid in that. If I were gonna adopt this, I think I'd be asking wh wh whoever I'm buying it from to be clear about the evidence. And I think I'd look carefully at 
evidence collected by people other than the than the person selling CTA. Mm -hmm. Well, who should people follow uh, via social media or research articles, et cetera, if they want to kind of stay up to date on this? Well, I think Googling it helps, I, particularly if you do that from the standpoint of a computer system that's linked into a university somewhere so that you get a pretty comprehensive search. This research goes on all over the world. I mean, Europeans are very heavily involved in this. As I, one of the examples I gave was a big one we did in Germany. Well, that obviously there's people there that are curious about it. So monitoring published articles, probably the best. All right, thank you. Well, let's shift gears again here. Now let's talk about motivation. Um, you, you recently, you told me that uh, you were working on something based on your HBR article that uh, you co-authored with uh, Broer Saxberg. Can you give uh, our audience here a little overview of that article and uh, what you d discussed and presented about uh, motivation? Yeah, to put it in perspective, um, for many years, uh, a number of us have been interested in motivation and even doing research on it. But the problem with the motivation research after B.F. Skinner sort of decimated psychology by convincing everybody he'd solved the problem, and he didn't, obviously, is that there are people are working on all pieces of this everywhere. But very few people are trying to put it together into a framework or a system that you could actually apply uh, and at work or in school, for that matter. Uh, so that's what Brewer and I have attempted to do. First of all, we did a research review that was fairly extensive and published that. That was peer reviewed and published. And then the, uh, we were contacted by people from the Harvard Business Review asking us if we wouldn't do a sort of a more um, translated version of that for people in business. So we, we, the framework that we developed, we call the Beck framework, B as in Baker, E as in Edwards, C as in Charlie. And it stands for belief, expectancy, and control, which are three of the biggest issues in motivation, we think. So that model that, we, that, that the Harvard Business Review published, which has gotten a lot of attention since, uh, suggests the following, that motivation is defined as three things. Any one or a combination of three things. First of all, starting a job or a task. Secondly, persisting once you start and avoiding being distracted uh, by more appealing maybe, but less important tasks. Uh, that turns out to be one of the biggest motivation problems. And, second, and thirdly, that once you start and persist, investing enough mental effort to succeed. And by the way, People can start and persist and not invest enough thought to succeed at something. Primarily, it turns out because they're overconfident. They think they already know how to do it and they don't. And so they start rejecting feedback that says you're not performing well. That's not my problem. It's the test you're using for my, whatever it is. So those three things are critical. Then there are four things that influence those motivation, any one of those three. And the four things are, first of all, values. Um, a person has to have some value for what it is that they're doing. And so when they don't, motivation suffers enormously. They won't start, they won't persist at something. So, uh, but here we learned also that the value that they have to perceive is meaningful to them individually and not to everybody else necessarily. And here's a mistake I think we make thinking, I think supervisors, line, line managers often think that the values that they hold dear are held dear by everybody else. And that I think is one of the biggest mistakes we make in training, especially for live trainers. I, I, people, what you value is not necessarily what somebody else values. So we have a number, we generate a number of strategies for how to generate value when people don't appear to value. A, 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 we could talk more about that, but let me move on because we could go on and on about some of these things. All right, second thing was confidence, self-confidence. It's actually called, in psychological terms, it's called self-efficacy. Some people on, watching the video will remember Albert Bandura, who's been around forever, still around actually, amazing, in his 80s, making good, doing good work. But he, that's his notion. And his theory was that 
the more specific your confidence is about a specific task, the more that you'll be motivated to perform that task. I mean, uh, this guy, Sismanthi, that does the flow stuff. I think that was his theory also. When uh, your interest and in, in a task and your your confidence about it are sort of joined, you're in, in a flow series and so on. So you have to believe that you're that you're able enough to succeed at the task in order to engage in it. You can't believe that you that you're unable to to learn it and perform it. You can't believe that you already know how because those two beliefs will get you into trouble. Um, now, self-efficacy is a real interesting thing. It varies a lot between cultures and it's easy to measure, it turns out. So that, that's a very big item. Those first two values in self-efficacy are big. Number three was emotions. If a person is angry, depressed, frightened, very anxious, they're not going to actually be very motivated to work at something. And that deep emotion, that negative emotion does not have to be connected to the job. It can be what's going on at home. It can be people's upset about the, this virus that's killing people. I mean, there's a whole lot of reasons to kind of be negative, depressed, and angry lately. And so it's a, it's a total motivation killer. And there are ways to overcome it. I think this, this data about and emotional intelligence, actually, there's some insights there and so on. And so we offer some of those. And finally, uh, something that happens to everybody, even the most capable, motivated workers occasionally hit a bump at work. I mean, they're told they're not doing well in an area where they thought they were doing very well. And that makes them begin to wonder whether uh, whether they, they actually are as able as they think, whether they actually can control what's going on, uh, whether they can succeed. Maybe I've missed, maybe I'm wrong about myself. Maybe I actually can't, or maybe that person's down on me and I'm actually doing well and they're giving me negative evaluation. Maybe then I can't control their understanding of my capabilities. We call them attribution failures. In other words, where your belief about what caused that feedback leads you to a next belief, which says, I don't know if I can do anything about this. There was one other little twist on all this that I think is worth mentioning, particularly with this focus this month. And for those that see this later, will remember the Black Lives Matter movement, which is incredibly important. And there are many people who are trained to do something, who sit there and think, oh yeah, well, I can learn this and they value it and so on but somebody like me is never going to be permitted to do it. So you not only have to believe you can do it, you have to believe that you'll be permitted to do it, not denied by prejudice, women can't do this, people of African-American descent can't do this and so on and so forth. That is a motivation killer immediately. That's it. Thank you, thank you so much for that. When, people, when you're doing analysis, what are some of the things that one should look for? I think some, what you just shared with us are things that we can look for where other people will be permitted to do something. And, and I think an analyst might be able to uncover some of that. But do you have any, any tips for the analyst uh, as they're doing this as to what exactly they might look for? What are symptoms of potential motivation issues? Well, let's, let's start out with um, the values, because I, I think that's the, uh, we usually try to build reasons into training for doing things. The, you know, the reason for doing X is Y. Um, reasons for who? Reasons to compel and to interest who? In other words, the more you know, I think, about the values of your trainees, the more you're going to be able to build that into the rationale that you give people for doing what it is you're being asked to do. Efficacy. People have to be convinced that they can learn to do something um, and have to be convinced that it's novel, that this is not something they've done before. You want that to be true, by the way. People shouldn't be selected for training that can already do the job. We don't really have great measures of prior knowledge, actually. That's another serious issue in training, I think. And there are some solutions to that that 
people are not looking at, I think. But on the whole, efficacy is also a very big issue. Emotionality, I don't know that you can anticipate that. Um, attributions, problems, people's belief that, they, that, that they're having a problem, that doesn't happen until after training when you're trying to learn or implement what it is that you've learned. So values and efficacy considerations as you're designing training are pretty important, I think, for motivating the people that are gonna be doing it. What can an instructor or facilitator do when confronted with what they believe is an unmotivated learner? Are, is well, there something that they that, can do without just, you know, being a cheerleader? Yeah. Uh, you know, that's actually what our article is about. It's, it's really for people that are trying to give support to people that are, are either in training or performing at work. And what we do is, is demonstrate how to identify each one of these problems. Now, there's a few questions you can ask is you observe people, you listen to them when they talk to you. You know, active listening is a huge skill, I think, that is not very often employed. Keeping your mouth shut and listening when you ask, what's going on? I, I am difficult, I having trouble there. What's happening? What do you think's happening? And then try to figure out, well, is this a value problem? Is this an efficacy problem? Is this person in just sunk in depression or anger about something that's interfering with their work? All those things have different, require different approaches, I think. Thank you. Who should uh, people follow on social media, video, research and articles if they want to stay up to date on uh, motivation? Well, oh, motivation. Well, uh, I don't, I think actually that's, would take a very long time. I, I, there, there's a, a good 25 to 30 people out there that are doing truly exciting work and motivation. None of them, in my view, are focused on work. They're all focused on K-12 education. And the reason for that is that there's more interest in K-12 motivation, uh, K-12 uh, improving motivation in K-12 education. And by the way, it's doubled and tripled that interest now that we are starting to do more online instruction. And you know, there's, <laughs> I remember the early days of televised instruction where we used to take videos of students who are watching videos uh, at, at, at a university. And I think only about 5% of them were paying any attention whatsoever to the screen. They were reading newspapers, they were chatting. You don't know what the person's doing on the other end of the line when you're doing this. So the question is, how do you identify people that are not motivated? Well, let me say briefly that about three years ago, we took a version of this uh, Beck model and we built it into online instruction so that the computer was actually trying to determine when people had lost motivation. And then the computer would ask trainees questions and try to determine what was the reason that they were having motivation issues and then would try either to solve those issues or to tell the instructor, you need to contact this student because they have this issue going on, you might be able to help them with it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's shift gears again here. Uh, you, in previous conversations that we've had, you've talked about artificial intelligence and learning and development and the, the promise and upside that you see. What's, what's the current state uh, of evidence-based practices regarding artificial intelligence in the L&D domain? Well, um, I don't, think that there's a lot of artificial intelligence initiatives in training and development. Um, not that I've heard of anyway. And I try to keep track because we've received a fairly sizable grant from the Schmidt Found Family Foundation uh, to conduct, uh, uh, to make an AI version of our cognitive task analysis system. So I'm sort of stumbling through trying to learn something about artificial intelligence. While we're conducting this, I'm along with uh, my colleague, Ken Yates at USC. Um, Ken is doing most of the management of the AI project. Um, and what we're learning is how extremely difficult it is. I mean, imagine you, you not only have to teach a computer to listen to all of the interactions between an analyst and uh, a subject matter expert and duplicate those interactions, but that computer has to be able to listen for highly technical terms. 
So you have to, you're out there looking for glossaries that are very detailed that have, and, and for extremely sophisticated um, uh, systems for recognizing English when it's spoken and technical English terms. Um, you have to get the computer to recognize the difference between steps, types of steps, actions, decisions, how to code those things. It, 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 is, it is really complex. Uh, it's much more difficult than teaching a human being to do it, as you can imagine. Uh, so uh, a project which has been going on now for about six months, I think, five, six months, I believe that we have at least two and a half more years if we can, can continue because we're gonna need more money to finish this thing, if we do. And I think actually we're gonna find there are, there's, soft, there's software out there that needs to be developed that has never been developed to make this work. All right, so that's number one. Number two, part of your question was, what's the possible impact of, of AI? And I'm making a guess uh, that all of training development is gonna be AI supported in the future. And that people in AI are going to not be doing what they've been doing in the past. They're going to be solving problems, problems that the AI has not solved, challenges that we don't have expertise to cover. So we need to develop expertise that then we can drag it into an AI system that already exists. So the bottom line is that it's going to decrease the cost of, of front end analysis and design. It's gonna increase, I think, the effectiveness because these AI systems can be evidence-based and they don't resist learning evidence-based approaches, basically. So it, will it also impact development then, searching for content and sorting through content and arranging content per the design? Can you teach a computer to do that? I think maybe some of it, not all of it. I mean, where do we, we get most of our examples from the internet. Even when an expert says, well, we have an example here at the company that maybe you could use, that might be a pr proprietary example, but it almost always comes to us on the internet. So that's readable by a computer. Uh, it's insertable in training. And I can't imagine what a computer can't do except something that we have no expertise now at doing. This is gonna be a revolution. I, I truly believe it. I know there's a lot of enthusiasm about this, but why wouldn't we train computers to do what we do consistently and let our minds focus on things that we can't yet do, but need to do? Well, I think there's, besides the enthusiasm, there's some fear perhaps in the ranks that people are going to be displaced by AI in the training and development, learning and development field. Uh, however, there's gonna be new jobs, I imagine, that are gonna be created and necessary uh, to embrace AI in the field. So it's this, is all part of the res this is all part of the resistance to new technologies. Mm -hmm. We can go back in history and take a look at every technology uh, caused the same issue. It displaces people and I think that we ought to be learning from history and not railing against it. I mean, basically the question is, it's gonna be a very long time before this happens. It is not gonna happen in this current generation of training designers. But, it, but the next generation, I think, ought to be more aware of what can be done in AI and what can't and begin to position themselves to do what can't be done by AI. Well, hopefully that will reduce some of the current fear factor that uh, may exist. I hope. Uh, you mentioned emotional intelligence and uh, I've, I've read from certain people that they see it as a false construct. What's your take on emotional intelligence? I think if you mean it like, um, uh, like IQ, yes, it's a, that's false. It, you, you can't generate a test of emotional intelligence that's meaningful, I think. However, we do know that there are strategies that have been developed to help people deal with strong emotions, strong negative emotions. I mean, depression is one of the biggest debilitating events that can happen in a person's life. And some people, I mean, it's, it's, a largest, it's, it's the largest cause of, of suicides, 
it's it's a very very um, damaging emotion when it goes too far. Anger, same. Some people have extremely difficult time controlling their anger, and everybody gets angry occasionally. So. How do you control those things? Well, there are strategies, actually. And there are strategies that have some pretty good evidence behind them. So those things, I would say, are not only valuable, but we should begin to add them to the things that we train people to do at work because they interfere with people's performance. And I, I, not for the, only on the behalf of the employer. I think it's on the behalf of all of us that we learn how not to hurt ourselves when we are deeply depressed or extremely angry. I don't think that either one of those things is productive under any circumstance. Thank you. Let's shift again here to, uh, we've talked in the past about the uh, APA's big five. Um, and it's a, as a valid approach to personality assessments and, you know, to be used in place of to displace Myers-Briggs and DISC and other such models. Can you share with us an overview of the big five and how it can and should be used? You know, I should have memorized the big five and I haven't. I'll, I'm going to try right now to make a list. I probably will get at least four of them. For example, one is something called conscientiousness. You know, these are, this is your inclination to do a good job, to check, to make sure that the task that you were assigned is what you're doing, making sure that you're, you've got it planned so that you get it done on time and to standard and so on. Conscientious people are a huge value, you know, very valuable at work, I think. Uh, secondly, um, neuroticism, it's called. But what's it, what's, what it actually means is how negative are you? How optimistic or pessimistic are you? Um, and that is a huge predictor of, of productivity at work also. Um, third thing, um, sociability. Uh, the question that's usually asked to determine how sociable people are is, where do you recharge when you're kind of feeling washed out or burned out? Uh, do you need a group of people around you to feel alive again and to recharge, or do you do that by yourself? I have a friend that calls it crawling under the porch. You know, if you're really down and you're looking to recover, do you crawl under the porch and kind of sit by yourself and relax for a while? Or do you run out and try to be with a lot of friends kicking out? Uh, so that's number three. Number four is openness to experience. Um, how do you feel about novelty? Do you like it? Or is it something that you're a little wary about? I, you, there are people that are happiest when they're in routine settings, not doing the same thing all the time, but where, where, where they're performing is more reliable. It, they, what they expect is often what happens and so on and so forth. On the other hand, there's people that just thrive for novelty. Something, give me something different to do. I'm bored with this. And um, the, 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 the continuation from extremely open to experience to very close to experience is another thing. Now, I've forgotten the fifth one. I knew I'd forget if one of the five. Uh, it, it'll come up as it, we it talk. Is, it escapes me as, uh, as uh, we're doing this, too, and I'm searching on the internet on my phone. <laughs> come up with that. It's not, and I've got a slow connection down there. But let, uh, let's talk about uh, measuring prior knowledge. You've made the comment that it's difficult yeah. to do that. So how... I mean, if we know what our, the end state is, the terminal objectives, the performance objectives and enabling knowledge and skill objectives, why, what was so difficult about this? The most important prior knowledge to have when you train people for work, to do something, not just to think or memorize something, that's not performance-based usually, but to actually perform step-by-step, -step, even extremely complex activity, flying a plane, examining a patent, doing a surgery. Those things, I think, require um, uh, a whole lot more effort, basically. Um, tell me more about your question. To answer it again so I can focus my answer a little bit. Well, if, if, if we were going to create both pre- and post-tests, of somebody's knowledge and or skill and or applications capability. Um, so I, I was just puzzled by, the, by you said, when you said you couldn't measure prior knowledge or it's difficult to measure prior knowledge, 
if I know what I want at the end, why can't I use the same post-test as the pre-test and measure and establish a baseline for learners to see, you know, what kind of delta am I getting uh, after training? Well, the, the one that, the, the approach that seems to work better has been developed in, by the Australians, I think. Uh, John Sweller and his people in, in Australia. And what they're doing is they're, they're taking the post-test items, provided that the test is a test of how to do something step by step. And what they do is take an example that's a common example in the field where people are being trained to work. They describe the first few steps that they've captured in a cognitive task analysis. They stop and say, what's next? All right? And, there's, and then the trainee who's being pre-tested tries to describe what the next steps would be in this. And they do that with a number of different tasks. And when they do it, they look at things like, how long does it take the person to respond? Uh, when they respond, how many steps actually have to be performed that they're not describing for us? Uh, how, have they jumped ahead? How accurate is the step that's come up next? And they find a way to assess how much somebody knows about the performance impact, uh, uh, requirements of what they're learning and, and whether they need the training at all and what parts of the training that we could probably eliminate for them because it looks like they already know what they're doing in that area. So it's, it's a version of what we've done before. I think what's different about it is that almost all prior knowledge assessment is fact-based. It's conceptual knowledge not procedural knowledge. And conceptual knowledge is, is primarily important to help people modify procedures when they're at work. That's all, if something doesn't work that you've been trained to do, the conceptual knowledge about why you're learning to do this in the first place and why these steps should be important is what you use to edit the steps. You might have misunderstood in training, you might, this might be an unusual, a uh, case that was not part of the common application that you were trained to perform. In. Thank you. So uh, is the uh, non-conscious nature of knowledge an impact in, in this assessing prior knowledge? Because people don't know what they don't know and they would forget to mention it. And we would say, well, the, obviously then they don't know it, but in fact, yeah. they know it yeah. and rest actually do it. Yeah, when we do the, when we, when the research that got done on this, occasionally they, they sneak an expert or two into the pretest. And, and the expert will give you the next step. But what it turns out to be is A, accurate, and B, way on down the line. You see, so they're, they've already thought their way through eight or nine things that have to be done. And the next thing that they remember having to do is way on down the line. Mm -hmm. And so we can start to identify experts. And when we do, the recommendation is this person doesn't need to be trained. Mm -hmm. huh? Well, I think, yeah, it would be, be great if we could uh, learn how to avoid unnecessary training. And when we do training, that we get all the steps that are necessary for someone to be uh, performed competently. You know, and we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about how to avoid unnecessary training. I think that's been one of the well, the most important principles of the International Society for Performance Instruments and a couple of other trainer societies. But what we haven't done is spent a lot of time on what needs to be done step by step to make it happen. Sorry, because that's, we haven't actually appreciated the huge impact of this unconscious automated knowledge that always characterizes the skill of a top expert. And we do rely so heavily on uh, subject matter experts and too often one subject matter expert and we go to market with the product they, they've influenced and it's, it doesn't really uh, get the job done. 95% of training around the world is done by people who identify themselves as expert in the area they're training. Mm -hmm. I, I th that's, by the way, a terrible mistake, I, my view, because if you have an expert teach expertise, and they leave stuff out, they're confident that they've given you everything that they, uh, that they can and everything that you need to actually perform. And you often get actually pretty negative feedback from experts about how you're handling what they're teaching you to do. 
because they think they've told you everything you need to know. Yeah, big disconnect. Dick, thanks again for doing this HPT video with me today. And, and thank you for all of your contributions over the decades to, to the field, advancing evidence-based practices and instruction and performance improvement. As a final question, what's your advice for leadership and practitioners in the ISD and learning functions? If there's one important thing that I think we need to be doing a whole lot more of in L&D, it's focusing on the last decade or two of evidence about what works and what doesn't. In other words, to commit ourselves like medicine did 150 years ago when it made the transition from craft to technology, technology being a, a science informed profession, and start applying this research, start arguing about it because there's gonna be arguments about what good evidence supports and what it doesn't. But we at least have to be having these discussions in a knowledgeable way. That's not happening, but it's beginning to happen more and more. And it's, I think, Guy, it's people like yourself that's, that, that are really behind making this happen. I think we have to start linking people that are doing this work. We have to start discussing it. We have to make it valuable for people in L&D to actually get involved in it. And for now, I don't know that we've yet created the kind of value that they need enough to get enough of it done. And we also need to create value for people that are clients of L&D. Because if your client doesn't value it, you're generally not gonna do it and provide it to that client. So the question is, how do we do that? What do we know about how to persuade people that if they would only use more evidence-based work, that they'll succeed quicker and less expensively than they would with the way they're doing it right now? Dick, thanks so much. Have a, have a great day. Thank you, Joe. Thanks very much, Guy.